Hi everyone, in this video Tim and I are going to go over um, experiment 7, the synthesis of aspirin. Um, unlike a previous video, I wanted to talk about the hypothesis first. And the reason for that is you're going to find most of the answers to these questions throughout this video. So instead of me just answering all the questions at the end of the video, I thought I would just point out to you um, what you're looking for in the hypothesis. So it says sentence one should contain a specific prediction of the amount of aspirin that will be synthesized. In a minute, I'm going to go over the theoretical yield of aspirin. And whatever the theoretical yield is, is the amount you're going to expect to synthesize. Sentence two should contain uh, the following, the reactants, the catalyst, the products, and the limiting reagent. And again, we're gonna talk about the reaction in a minute, which will answer all of these questions. Um, a third sentence should contain the following, the technique that will be used to purify crude aspirin. Later on in the video, Tim will actually demonstrate how to use this technique and what to do. And he will also, during that time, talk about the theory of how it works. The fourth sentence should contain the following, the method used to determine the purity of the product and the expected result of that method. Um, at the end of the experiment, we were going to do a uh, melting point and you will see how that works. So now that you have a little bit of idea of what you're looking for as you go throughout the video um, in terms of writing your hypothesis, and it might be a good idea to kind of um, jot these things down as you go instead of trying to remember them all for the end, um, let's talk about the reaction itself. So what I have here is the reaction written out. So we're going to react salicylic acid, um, which is this molecule here, with acetic anhydride, which is here, and we're going to use as a catalyst phosphoric acid, H3PO4. And in a couple minutes, Tim will actually demonstrate what it's going to look like once you've actually mixed these things together, then you're going to have to heat them up to get them to um, react. And I've noticed here that in my aspirin, I forgot, um, part of the molecule, so there is a carboxylic acid group here. So essentially what we're doing is we're hooking part of this acetic anhydride, specifically this part, onto this OH here. And what this does is, and this is more of an organic chemistry discussion than a general chemistry discussion, but as you'll learn much more detail in organic chemistry, but just briefly to mention here, what this does is adding this group, the C double bond O bond CH3 group, is actually going to make this a weaker acid. Remember that carboxylic acids are acidic and people are ingesting aspirin. They're literally eating it. So you don't want this acid to be very strong. If this acid is strong, it could cause ulcers. And even asp aspirin to some extent can do that. Okay, this is obviously not a, um, anything about healthcare or any kind of medical advice, but by adding this group, we've decreased the strength of the salicylic acid and made it less acidic. And as you know, aspirin has pain relieving properties and it's also used, I believe, sometimes as a blood thinner. Side product of this reaction that we don't really care about is acetic acid, the stuff found in vinegar. So what we're gonna do specifically is we're gonna add three grams of this salicylic acid, which I'm gonna abbreviate SAL.A, so I don't have to write it out 100 times. All right, and we're going to add that to six milliliters of acetic anhydride. And I'm actually going to write it as 6.00 milliliters of acetic anhydride. And H3PO4 is a catalyst, which means it's not used up during the reaction. So we don't need to determine the amount of this or worry about the amount of this. And we want to figure out how much aspirin we can synthesize doing this. Well, this is a limiting reagent problem. Don't let these confusing structures confuse you. All you really care about is that we have one salicylic acid reacting with one acetic anhydride to form one aspirin. So in another way, what we care about is the stoichiometric coefficients. So in this case, I want to do figure out how much aspirin I can make with all of my salicylic acid, how much aspirin I can make with all of my acetic anhydride, and then whichever one is less aspirin, well, that's the amount of aspirin that I'm going to make because I'm going to run out of that material first. So let's do this. So I want to convert from grams of salicylic acid to moles of salicylic acid using the molar mass, then to moles of aspirin, which I'm going to abbreviate ASP, using the balanced chemical equation. One of these gives me one of these. And then finally to grams of aspirin using the molar mass of aspirin. So in order to do that, I'm starting with three grams, which you're going to weigh out at the beginning of the experiment, of the salicylic acid. Note, you're not going to be able to get probably exactly 3.00 grams, and you're going to have four decimal places, but around three grams. 
Now I want to convert that to moles. Well, I looked up on uh, Google a minute ago the molar mass of salicylic acid, which is 138.12 grams of salicylic acid per one mole of salicylic acid. Notice that I wanted salicylic acid in grams on the bottom, so the grams cancel out. Now I want to convert it to aspirin. To convert from moles of one thing to moles of another, we always use a balanced chemical equation. Well, we have a balanced chemical equation. One of these gives me one of these. So every one mole of salicylic acid provides me with one mole of aspirin. Finally, because at the end of the day, you're going to um, isolate your aspirin and weigh it and calculate the percentage yield, I want to find the uh, yield of aspirin in grams, not in moles. So therefore, I need to convert this to grams. So I use the molar mass. I, this time, I put one mole of aspirin on the bottom because I want moles to cancel out. And on top, I put the molar mass, which again, I just looked up on Google a minute ago, 180.18 grams of aspirin. When you do all this math, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat until you get to the end, I find that I will make 3.91 grams of aspirin. So what this means is if I use all three grams of salicylic acid, I can make 3.91 grams of aspirin. That being said, I don't know if I'm going to run out of salicylic acid first or if I'm going to run out of acetic anhydride first. So I need to repeat this entire procedure for acetic anhydride and basically determine which one I'm going to run out of first. There is a little bit of a trick with the acetic anhydride though, and that trick is it's a liquid. So you're not going to measure it out in grams, you're going to measure it out in milliliters. Now is it impossible to measure a liquid in grams? Of course not. We can measure the mass of a liquid on a balance. But because it's a liquid, it's easier to measure the volume, and therefore we need to convert this to grams. Well, how do you convert a volume to grams? You use the density. So what we want to do is we want to go from milliliters of acetic anhydride to grams of acetic anhydride using the density. It's the only step that's different. Everything else is going to be the same. Once I have grams of acetic anhydride, I want to go to moles of acetic anhydride, then to moles of aspirin, and finally to grams of aspirin. So it is one extra step to convert those milliliters into grams using the density, which again, I just looked up on Google. So starting with 6.00 milliliters of acetic anhydride times, it turns out that the density is 1.08 grams per milliliter. Well, that means there's 1.08 grams in one milliliter. So I put one milliliter of acetic anhydride on the bottom because I want milliliters to cancel out. And I put on top 1.08 grams of acetic anhydride times. Now I want to convert from grams to moles using the molar mass. So 102.099 grams of acetic anhydride per one mole of acetic anhydride times. Now I want to convert from moles of acetic anhydride to moles of aspirin. Remember, whenever you're converting from moles of one thing to moles of another, you always use a balanced chemical equation. And again, even though these are confusing, it's still just one to one. So for every one mole of acetic anhydride, I'm going to use one mole of aspirin. Finally, I need to convert from moles of aspirin to grams of aspirin. If you recall, I already did that, moles to grams. For both for aspirin. So I can just use, because I'm doing the same conversion, I can use the same conversion factor. So I'm going to put one mole of aspirin on the bottom and on top 180.18 grams of aspirin. When I do all of that work, I get 11.4 grams of aspirin. So what does this mean? It means if I use all of my salicylic acid, I get 3.91 grams of aspirin. If I use all of my acetic anhydride, I get 11.4 grams of aspirin. Therefore, I'm going to run out of salicylic acid first. Once I have 3.91 grams of aspirin, I am going to have zero salicylic acid left. Said another way, salicylic acid is the limiting reagent and 3.91 grams of aspirin is the theoretical yield. 
okay because i'm going to run out of the salicylic acid first even though i have left leftover acetic anhydride i can't possibly make any more aspirin once my salicylic acid is gone so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Tim and he's going to show you some of the practical things um, that you actually have to do in order to uh, achieve this reaction. So now I'm going to show you what you're going to practically do to start the reaction in the lab. So I have measured here in my 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask my about 3.044 grams of acetic or of salicylic acid. I have over here six milliliters of acetic anhydride ready to add to my flask. And in the background, I have a hot water bath that's heating up. It's recommendable that uh, when you're performing this experiment, you do like I have and get your hot water bath to start heating before you perform the experiment, because otherwise you're just going to sit around waiting for your water to get hot. You can turn the uh, knob on the hot plate up to around 350, a little higher, to get it started boiling. But once it starts boiling, you can turn it down a little bit uh, so that it doesn't boil too aggressively. You only need a gentle boil because once it starts boiling, the water doesn't get any hotter. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to take my acetic anhydride. I'm going to pour that into my salicylic acid. The lab manual mentions that you can use a couple of additional milliliters to wash down any excess salicylic acid from the sides of the flask, but that isn't really necessary. I have off camera here my bottle of phosphoric acid, so I'm going to take a pipette and I'm going to very carefully add my 5 to 10 drops of phosphoric acid. So, 3... Alright, so, it's a catalyst, so we don't need uh, that much of it, so we just add our 10 drops. And then I'm going to put this into my hot water bath. I have a 400 milliliter volumetric flat or 400 milliliter beaker filled to around the 225 milliliter line uh, with regular tap water um, so that it's, it's uh, got enough to cover the level of our um, the level of our solution, but not so much that it's flowing out when I put it in there. So a couple of things I want to talk about uh, before we go on to the next step of the experiment. First of all, uh, you notice there are three uh, beakers on the hot plate right now. The reason for that is simple. You don't need to each have your own individual hot plate in the hood uh, to perform this experiment. You can share with partners and other groups so that you only have a handful of hot plates in the hood instead of all ten. Second, it's really important that you make sure you do not put water into your Erlenmeyer flask for your reaction. The Erlenmeyer flask has phosphoric acid and acetic anhydride in it. Um, and adding water to acetic anhydride can cause a very exothermic reaction, which can cause it to explode. Uh, so we want to make sure we're not adding any pure water to that reaction until our acetic anhydride has mostly been consumed by the reaction. When you're working with the acetic anhydride and phosphoric acid, make sure you're being very careful uh, not to get any water in it and that you're wearing your gloves and your goggles and your lab coat at all times because they are dangerous chemicals. 85% phosphoric acid is very concentrated and can easily burn you. So you'll notice that my Erlenmeyer flask, uh, when I put it into my solution, I turned it away from myself, just in case any of that uh, exploding I talked about happens. It happens away from me and not towards me. So in the lab manual, we tell you to boil your solution for uh, your water bath for about 10 minutes. So I'm going to let this go for about 10 minutes, and when it's done, I will come back to move forward with the rest of the reaction. You notice that as my beaker begins to boil, my uh, flask gets a little bubbly, so I've turned it down so that it boils a little less vigorously so that we don't have any water that spills out of it uh, during the reaction. So it's been about 10 minutes, and our flask has been in the boiling water the entire time, uh, so I'm going to take it out. Now, it's important to be careful because the flask uh, is going to be hot, right? We've had boiling water in it for the last 10 minutes, so we need to be careful taking it out. The flask could be quite hot, so use caution, take it out, and just put it right down so that it can cool down. 
The next thing we're going to do is we're going to let it cool down for a few minutes uh, to room temperature, and then we'll add some water. So I will come back to the video uh, after we've had time to let it cool down. So it's been a few minutes and our flask is cool to the touch. I can touch it on the base here and see that it's nice and cool. So I'm going to add my 20 milliliters of water. Um, but first I do want to make a note um, that the uh, lab manual says to add a couple milliliters of water to your flask while it's on the hot plate and that's really unnecessary and uh, it could potentially cause a problem if you still have uh, a healthy amount of unreacted uh, acetic anhydride in the flask so we skipped that and we're just gonna go straight to adding the 20 mils of water after the uh, flask has had time to cool down so off camera right now I'm measuring out about 20 milliliters of water the exact volume isn't super important just around 20 milliliters so I'm going to put 20 milliliters of water into my flask, and you can see on camera what was a clear solution is no longer a clear solution. Uh, we've started to form some precipitate, but in order to really form our precipitate, we're going to need to put it into an ice bath, but luckily for us, we no longer need to do this in the hood, so I'm going to take the flask out to the bench, and we're going to complete the rest of the experiment uh, on the bench. So I've already gone ahead and taken my Erlenmeyer flask and put it into an ice bath, um, which if I tilt this a little bit, you can see it is packed with ice and each Erlenmeyer flask is filled right up to the neck uh, with ice on the outside. Make sure you're not putting ice inside your flasks, just on the outside. You'll also notice that there are five flasks in here and I'm only using one for my experiment. Uh, you can share an ice bath with the other people in your lab. You don't need each group to go down and get their own set of ice from the ice machine because it's not in the lab. You can get one big bucket and share it with several groups. Um, once you've taken your flask and put it into your ice bath, you'll notice that more precipitate will form. It's a little hard to see on the camera, but you can certainly see that there's solid at the bottom of that flask. If you notice that solid is not forming fairly rapidly once you start to put it in the ice bath, you can take a glass stirring rod and you can scratch at the bottom of the flask. All I'm doing is taking the stirring rod and rubbing it against the bottom and the sides of the flask that are in the solution. Uh, and that helps to promote uh, nucleization by giving a nucleization point for your uh, precipitate in the solution to form the solid uh, rather than remaining in solution. So once you've given it a few minutes to really cool down and you've potentially needed to use your glass stirring rod to help uh, form some crystals and you see that there's plenty of crystals at the bottom of your solution, you can go ahead and you can start to do the next step of the experiment, which is the filtration. So for filtering, we're going to do something pretty similar to last time. Just give me one second to remove my ice bath out of the way here. Just slide that back here. And you can see we have our filtration system set up. This is exactly like it was in the previous experiment with one small change. We still have our, uh, our ring stand, our vacuum tubing, our uh, 250 milliliter uh, filtration flask. We still have our three prong clamp holding it in place. All of those things are the same. The only difference is what we're gonna filter it in. Last time we used a Buchner funnel. This time we're going to use what's called a sintered glass funnel. You'll find these in the lab. Uh, they're small little uh, glass filter um, apparatuses. So you can see in the bottom there is a, what looks like white uh, solid and that's actually a filter which will allow you to filter the solid in your solution. And you're also going to need in the same drawer as that uh, one of these little plastic rings called a pleuro stopper and that's going to be used to hold your uh, centered glass funnel in order to form an effective vacuum. So I'm just going to put it on here. I'm going to give it a little push so that it stays a little secure, and I'm going to turn on the vacuum. So my vacuum is now on, and I can tell because my centered glass funnel doesn't just pull straight out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, flask, and I'm going to pour it through my uh, my centered glass funnel. 
Once I've poured it through, I'm going to use some excess water to help me transfer any solid that may have uh, failed to make it through uh, on the first try. So I'm just going to give it a little swirl so that everything's nice and uh, in solution. And I'm going to just slowly pour it through my filter flask. And you can see uh, that my filter flask is pulling liquid through. If I move this out of the way, you can see liquid flowing through my filter flask on the camera. And I'm just going to pour the rest of my solution in here. And there's even some really solid parts at the bottom of the solution that I'm just going to tap in uh, nice and gently. And now you can see there's still a lot of solid left in my flask. So that's what I was talking about with the extra water. I'm just going to take a little water and I'm going to pour that into my flask and I'm only pouring you know maybe 10 milliliters total of water probably less into my flask I'm gonna give it a swirl so that it picks up as much of it as possible and then I'm gonna pour that fairly quickly into my flask we swirl and pour it quickly in an attempt to get as much of the uh, the solid transferred as possible because the solid the aspirin is not very soluble in water so it won't dissolve but it will get moved by the water so once I give it a nice stir, or a nice swirl, the solid is picked up in the water but not dissolved. And then I pour it nice and quick before it has a chance to settle. And we have our solid present in our centered glass funnel. If I take a second to turn off my vacuum, I can show you once I take my centered glass funnel off. I can bring that closer and you can see there's a ton of solid at the bottom of our centered glass funnel. And that's what we're going to use in order to do the final two parts of our experiment, the melting point and the recrystallization. So for the next part of the experiment, we're back in the hood. I've taken my solid product and I've transferred it into a pre-teared 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. And you'll notice that it's still the same wet product that we had before. I don't know how well you can see that on the camera, but I didn't really dry it very well uh, because it turns out that the um, salicylic or acetyl salicylic acid, the aspirin, uh, doesn't dry very well. If you try to dry it in the oven or in a hot water bath, uh, you can heat it up too much and actually cause it to uh, decompose and then you lose your product. So even though the lab manual may say uh, that the uh, product should be dried, uh, depending on which edition of the lab manual we have, you should not do that. Instead, we're just going to know that our mass of our uh, product, both crude and recrystallized, is going to be unnaturally high because uh, it's wet. For instance, this uh, amount of product we got was about 5.5 grams, uh, which is of course well above the theoretical yield, which was only around 4 grams. So we've got too much product, but that's just because it's wet. So now what we're going to do is we're going to recrystallize that product. You can see on camera we've already got our hot plate with our hot solutions on it, um, ready to uh, do the next step. So I've got here 30 milliliters of 30% ethanol which I'm going to pour into my flask and I'm going to swirl it around a little bit. Now I want to take a second before I uh, move on too much uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the theory of recrystallization while I let this happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swirl it and just notice for now that you can still see solid at the bottom of the solution of the flask and I'm going to put it in our beaker to heat while I explain recrystallization. So recrystallization is a technique we use to purify our products in chemistry. So essentially when we finished this experiment we had um, our aspirin product but of course no reaction is perfect so there's going to still be some other things that are present in the solution. We know for a fact that we added acetic anhydride in excess because we know salicylic acid was our limiting reagent, so we know that there's still um, acetic anhydride in there. And uh, on top of that, we know that there was a catalyst, the phosphoric acid that we asked phosphoric acid that we added, both of which are still going to be present in our solution. So we want to try to get rid of those things in order to be measuring uh, the yield and eventually melting point of specifically our aspirin product. So we're going to do what's called recrystallization. 
For a recrystallization, what you need is you need a solvent in which your product specifically is soluble at high temperatures and insoluble at low temperatures, and all of your impurities are soluble uh, to a higher degree at both uh, temperatures. So what we have here currently is we have our product, which is not very soluble in our 30% ethanol mixture at low temperatures. So what we're doing is we're heating up that solution so that it becomes soluble in the solution because the solubility of pretty much any solute increases as you increase the temperature of the solvent. So what we're doing for now is we're increasing the temperature of our solvent via this hot water bath in order to increase the solubility of our product. As the solubility increases, we'll see it start to dissolve into the solution and we'll be uh, ready to go on to the next step once all of it has dissolved. So I'm just gonna give my flask a little swirl just to make sure it's well mixed. You'll see that even on the camera, you can tell that the solid is less um, obvious on the camera. It's kind of a cloudy uh, solution instead of being huge chunks of solid that were at the bottom. And as I let it sit there for another minute, you can see that already my solution is pretty much clear. So I'm just going to give it another few seconds to finish dissolving uh, because it is a little foggy still. But uh, essentially what you've seen is the first step of recrystallization. We've taken our solid product and our impurities and we've heated them up in a solvent where our product is insoluble at low temperature. Now that the solvent is at high temperature, everything is soluble and as you can see on the camera, our flask is clear. Once everything is heated up, you can take it off of the hot plate. In fact, you don't want to leave it on for too long because you can start to boil off your solvent. So we're going to go ahead and take it right off. You can see that it is clear on the camera and I'm going to let it cool to room temperature. Now, the important thing when it comes to recrystallization is forming your crystals. If you let the solution cool too quickly, uh, for instance, if we were to take that flask and put it straight into an ice bath, you would immediately form product, but the product would form with very small crystals. Those very small crystals are very hard to filter. So instead, we want to do this such that we create larger crystals. To create the larger crystals, we have to cool our solution slowly. So what we did is we took our flask out of the hot water bath and we're going to let it cool to room temperature. Once it's cooled to room temperature, then we're going to be able to cool it down further in the ice bath in order to generate our crystals. And then once we've got our crystals, we can measure them in the uh, the melting point apparatus to determine the melting point of our uh, crystals. So we've given our uh, product a few minutes to cool down to room temperature and place it in the ice bath for a few minutes. And now we've got here, you can see, a nice cloudy solution containing our precipitate. Hopefully that precipitate is almost exclusively our aspirin product and our impurities like the acetic anhydride and the salicylic acid have remained in solution. Uh, again, um, all we need to do is take it and filter it back in the centered glass funnel exactly like we did last time. And then we'll have our solid product, which we can measure the mass of and take the melting point of. It's important to, again, not dry it in the oven or on a hot water bath or anything like that because the aspirin will decompose. So you can just take the uh, wet uh, recrystallized product and use that to determine your uh, final yield and your melting point. So the only thing left to go over is the melting point. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Once you've collected your final crystals through the filtration method, you'll have your crystals left in a centered glass funnel. The first thing you're going to want to do is get the mass of your crystals so that you can calculate your percent yield. In this video, I'm not going to do that because my percent yield is not particularly important. After you've obtained your percent yield, you're going to want to get a melting point of your pure product to compare to the melting point of your impure product. I'm going to show you how to do that now. The first thing you're going to need is one of these melting point capillary tubes, which can be found near the melting point apparatuses in the lab. Please make sure you're using gloves while you handle these tubes, as the oils from your hand can actually affect the measurement, and you don't want something as simple as that to ruin your experiment. Once you've obtained one of the tubes, you'll find that one end of it is open, while the other end of it is closed. You'll want to take the open end of it, turn it upside down, 
and just tap it into your product to get some into the tube. Then you'll want to take it and tap it on a hard surface to get the material to the bottom of the tube. If tapping the material on the bottom of the tube doesn't work for you, you can take one of the brushes used to clean your glassware and rub it against the capillary tube until all of your material has made its way to the bottom of the tube. Then you can bring the tube over to the melting point apparatus and get your melting point measurement. This is a melting point apparatus. A melting point apparatus is a very simple instrument which simply heats up very quickly while you wait to see your material melt and become a liquid. To use this melting point apparatus, there are a few things you need to be aware of. First is this red number here, which shows the current temperature of the melting point apparatus. Next to it, you see a little view hole, which when you're using this, you'll look through to be able to see your material. Off to the left here, we have a switch that when held up or held down, will cause the temperature of the melting point apparatus to increase rather quickly. And on the right hand side that you can't see on camera is a small opening for you to place your melting point capillary tube. For this video, as you can see, you can't really see through the melting point uh, apparatus's view hole very well. So I'm, I'm gonna use my phone as a sort of secondary camera to allow us to magnify that view hole so that you can see it more clearly. When you're performing the experiment, please don't use your camera to do this. Simply use your eye right up against the view hole. As previously explained, you're simply going to take your capillary tube and insert it product end first into the small hole on the side of the apparatus. And as you can see, you can see that product right in the viewer. Please be extremely careful when putting the capillary tube in and taking the capillary tube out of the melting point apparatus as it can easily break, which would clog the machine and make it unusable for any other students. Once it's in, you simply hold up on the switch and as you can see in a second the temperature reading on the front of the instrument will start to increase rather rapidly. You'll want to stop holding up on the instrument's uh, temperature control about 30 degrees shy because otherwise the instrument will continue to increase in heat far beyond what you want and it'll take longer to cool down for the next group. When doing a melting point measurement, you're going to take two measurements. The first measurement is going to be when you see the very first drop of liquid form. That's the beginning of your melting point range. For the second point on your melting point range, you're going to measure when the entirety of your sample has become a liquid. Those two numbers combined will form your melting point range. Please remember that in our lab, whenever we perform a melting point, we will always measure it as a range instead of a single number. We do this because we can't be exactly precise like some other more sophisticated labs can in determining the exact uh, degree temperature at which our material melts. So all of ours are done as a range. As you could see earlier in the video, I let go of the instrument's temperature control around 85 degrees, and it still managed to get all the way up to 115 degrees. Now that it's at 115 degrees and close to where we know it's gonna melt, we can use small bursts of energy by holding up on the switch to heat the instrument up to the range where our sample will actually melt. So what I'm doing here is just holding it until it starts to heat up again. Then I'm going to release off of it until I see where it starts to slow down. And if it slows down and stops heating below my melting point, I'll have to just simply tap up on it again for a short period of time. As you can see, our material has melted in its entirety. You can no longer see the white solid present in our viewer, and we've completed our measurement. When you're doing this, you'll wanna make sure you take those two number measurements we talked about so that you have a measurement to report to your TA.